Are you comfortable, Ms. Divet? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Mm. Chief Justice. Are you well? I'm well, thank you. Good, good. Um, you hold two law degrees from the University of Stellenbosch, a BA degree and an LLB degree, That's which correct. you obtained in 1995. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then became a junior lecturer there at your alma mater? Yes, I did, for a year. <laughs> but ju just for a year, was it? Yes, I was doing my LLM at the time in mm -hmm. labor law and in arbitration. And as I indicated in my application, I, I completed the four uh, subjects on, for the LLM. But then I started working um, as a labor consultant um, in Worcester, in the, uh, in, and then I joined the bar, mm -hmm. and then I guess as a result of the new practice and so forth, I did not complete the, the mini thesis as we called it in those day, days. So that's why I was appointed for a year period. Yes, and you never completed that, that, that master's degree. Yes, now I'm very <laughs> sorry about that, and I must <laughs> still do something about it, but I think life and the practice life in caught my up family. with you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I see that uh, you, you had four children in the interim, and I, I, I think I, I understand exactly what happened to you. <laughs> Thank you. You joined the Cape Bar in 1997. That's correct. And that's where you, 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 you are at the, at the moment. Yes, I have mm. been practicing there ever since. All right, it's been a long while. Uh, what, what kind of work uh, do you do? What kind of cases uh, engage your practice? I initially, um, because I came straight from university to the bar, I, most of my work consisted of pro bono criminal work and um, legal aid work. And I really had to work hard in order to establish myself at the bar. I didn't really know any attorneys or I didn't have any connections in order to rise in, in my practice. And um, I would say after about eight to nine years in practice, I did a little bit of, of um, civil work in the beginning as well, mm. divorces and unopposed motions. But I would say after I was at the bar for about 10 years, my practice started developing into more a serious matter and I started doing different matters, a bit of commercial law, um, but in general, my practice has really been focusing on labor law and on matrimonial matters in the context of children. Mm -hmm. And I see that um, you have been serving as a commissioner of the Small Claims Court since 2004. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I have been. I'm, I'm still a commissioner. Obviously, if, when I'm acting, I can't sit as a commissioner, but mm -hmm. during recess in the times I did not act, I would do double duty. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I think that the Small Claims Court is such an important institution um, to make sure that everyone has got access to justice, that I'm, I'm very proud that I've been involved there for so long. Yeah. And... Um, it feels good to be able to, to give that facility to everyone um, in the country. Yeah. Um, do, do you believe that the experience you would have gained there uh, would assist a career in, 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 in well, the, 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 the job you seek today? Yes, I, I, I think so. Um, Obviously, it, it happens in a, in a court context, mm. and um, it, um, it's, over the years, it's become a bit more complex, seeing that there's the, uh, the limit for amounts you can claim in the small claims court has increased. Uh, but definitely, it has given me a lot of experience. I, none of my judgments there has ever been taken on review, and I... Also, in that context, I've also always tried to see if the, if the litigants can't resolve their differences when they arrive at the small claims court. Um, because 
often people that arrive there really want an opportunity to state their case and to be heard. And when the other party, without any lawyers being present, there's often uh, the parties reach some or other resolution with regards to their dispute. And, and I think that's also extremely important uh, that parties get that opportunity to try and resolve their differences prior to a court or a commissioner giving a judgment. You have had um, a number of acting stints in, in, the, in the Western Cape Division. Yes. of the High Court, starting in, in 2017 already. Yes. Uh, and are you acting there now? I'm acting at the moment. In, in 2017, I um, just uh, did half a term. And then during 2020, I think it was during the hard lockdown and COVID, mm -hmm. I um, also just did half a term in 2020. And then in 2021, last year, I was privileged and, and was invited to um, sit for a full term. And then I, I think I did the third, the second, third, and last term in 2021. Mm -hmm. And then in this term, I, this year, I did, um, I acted the first term, and then I acted last term, and I'm acting okay. now as well. Yeah, so you, you have had um, ample opportunity to sink your teeth in, 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 into the work. Yes. Uh, and I see that you've been exposed to a whole range of, of cases um, during those, um, those things. You listed um, five reserve judgments when, when you submitted your application. Have they been delivered yet? Yes, all of them. All of them? Yes. All right. And the parted matters you, you mentioned? I am still, I've still got quite a few parted matters. I started, I think, in um, the last term last year, I was allocated a human trafficking criminal matter. Um, it involves over 40 charges, um, and it's... it's um, it started November, and we've been depending on availability of um, various factors. We've not been able to, to finish the matter yet. Um, we hopeful that the state would um, close their case at the end of this term. So we're making progress, and as I said, the, the main reason really why it's taking so long is that we need two interpreters. Um, a lot of the complainants only speak Afrikaans, so we need an Afrikaans interpreter. And some of the two of the accused um, is from a, a different country, and we need to. I don't want to say too much about the matter, yes. but they. But so we need to translate it from into two different languages, and that really uh, makes it difficult to to deal with the evidence quickly. And then obviously we are also dealing with with young complainants and they come from from all over the, they they make arrangements to bring them from whichever um, province they live in in order to come and testify and we must obviously also have the necessary support systems in place some of the witnesses had little babies and were still they were still breastfeeding mm -hmm. other had still had some lingering other problems that we had to deal with during also we're still dealing with that during the trial yeah. How many written judgments have you been able to produce uh, during your acting stints? I, I attached, I think, eight judgments to the application as it was requested that we attach at least five. Yeah, yeah we limit the number. I, I see from the comments from the, uh, from the Bar Council that they could only find nine written judgments that I've delivered. And I took, made the effort to actually go and look at how many written judgments I've delivered. And I have delivered, besides these nine, at least 30 written judgments. I, ha I have them here, or I have a list of them. And then, of course, I, especially in, tw in 2021, I um, was allocated third division duty, as we call it in the Western Cape, where you deal 
with the with the with the role, the motion court role, as well as all the urgent applications. So in, in that court um, and dealing with urgent matters, I, I mostly dealt with the matters extempore, or I would, um, in very few of them, I would write judgments, um, unless the circumstances required it. So, so I've dealt with a substantial number of matters. I think just in 2021, with third division since I, I dealt with um, more than 600 matters that I could find um, in, in whilst I was looking now. But they're, of course, undefended matters that, that we deal with on the opposed motion role. All right. Or on average, how long did it take you to produce this, this judgment? On average, I would say about two months. Um, if the matters are more complicated or I need to... Uh, I do believe that people is entitled to, to proper reasons and, and why, the, especially the litigant who was not successful, expects um, reasons as to why a court made a certain decision. Mm -hmm. But on average, I would say two months. Mm -hmm. Have any of them been reported? I have, in the meantime, since my application, I've um, issued two judgments, which um, I, I think they've been published on SAFLI, and I don't know if they'll be reported, but one of my judgments was reported, I think it was also comment, the criminal uh, case I dealt with against the Minister of Police. Mm. Okay. The professional bodies have sent us comments on your suitability as a judge, and says they are not aware of any role you, that you may have played in transferring skills yes. to junior practitioners from the historically disadvantaged uh, section of, of our society in, during your entire career. And, uh, and they're going to say you have not demonstrated any affinity to play a role in advancing the ideal of transformation yes. to justify your appointment uh, in the division, in this division that still requires representativity and diversity on the bench. Yes. I don't know if you want to, to respond to, to this comment. Yes, if, if I may. I, I don't think that that comment um, is, is correct and I don't think it, it's fair. Um, even to my application, I've attached a, a, a very well substantiated letter. It's on pages 26 and 27. This is now in, in my bundle of Advocate um, uh, Davis, who was one of, of two uh, pupils I had. They were both women, and they're both previously disadvantaged women. And you would see from that letter um, written by my former pupil, um, which made me feel very proud, um, as to what I did just for her and other young practitioners um, as an advocate at the Cape Bar. I have always informally mentored um, all female uh, um, advocates at the bar. My door's always open. I've had fee-sharing arrangements with, uh, with uh, Advocate Davis, for example, but also other uh, practitioners within the labor field. Um, the state attorney, even though I am, am not a silk, I do a lot of, of labor matters for the state attorney, for the Department of Education, Department of Social Development over the years. And I have often there um, worked with juniors on, on a fee-sharing basis. And as Advocate Davis has stated here, this has assisted her to, to build on her labor law practice um, over the years. So, I don't think that, that that comment is true. I, I, I most definitely have assisted in my practice and in my personal life in order to transfer skills and make sure that everyone has an opportunity to practice law if that is their passion and, and what they want to do. 
All right. Um, the the GCB has made a, a strange comment. I'm, I'm not sure I, I even know what it means, but I'm going to put it to you so long so that you can defend your honor because it's it's in the public domain. Yes. Uh, and you can tell us what you, you, you think of it. They say some members, while viewing her performances and acting judge favorably, expressed reservations about the candidate as a practitioner in private practice concerning her ethical standards, moral compass, independent mindedness and judgment and it ends there. Do you want to say something to that? Yes, I would like to say something about mm. that um, acting chief justice. I was initially when I saw this comment, I was extremely disappointed and mm. upset. But yeah. having considered it and looking at the rest of the report, as you correctly mentioned, it, it is actually quite a strange statement to include in this because if you just look at the very next page of that comment, they carry on, whoever the reviewer was of this um, report, and I'll get to that now, which say, it says then that on the very next line, paragraph 2.2, .2, that considerable but not unanimous support was expressed by members for the candidate's appointment to the bench. And further on, in the same report, with regards to, um, I think it is on page, uh, dealing with um, the candidate's indep independent mindedness, um, it is commented that nothing in the candidate's judgment suggests that she is not independent minded and I am still recommended. I just mm. do want to point out that when the, the JSC sent out a letter to, to, or the General Bar Council sent out a letter to all the advocates and the, the, the different bars asking for comments and to that they attached a template in the form of what the JSC wanted them, how they wanted them to complete it and they also gave guidelines as to how to, for reviewers, how to deal with comments and in drafting this report. And very importantly in those guidelines, it says in paragraph 24, that any comments pertaining to um, character must, carries a significant risk because people make comments at the bar, we in a litigious environment, where we have litigated against each other in, in, on various occasions. And that one must always be mindful about the fact that comments may be made to settle old scores. And therefore, further on in paragraph 29, it specifically says that character comments should, favorable or not favorable, should not be included in any such report without there being a full statement of the facts and the circumstances giving rise to such a comment. And there's absolutely nothing. Yeah, yeah uh, speaking for myself, I'd, I'd like to think that any lawyer worth their assault would not uh, uh, submit input of this nature. It's gibberish, uh, uh, I mean, in, 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 in essence, and it does not assist this body at all. But that said, they also mentioned that uh, you once applied for silk and uh, was not recommended. May, may I ask uh, what happened with that application? Yes, that was in, in 2019. I, I can't remember how many applicants we were. Um, and um, I was not, uh, we were, in fact, quite a few women applied at the time and only uh, men were appointed as silk at the time and we were not afforded any reasons as to why, still not, as to why any of us for that matter, why our applications were not successful. So, so unfortunately, I, I think that that's a, a, a problem, one of the problems with the whole silk application system, but it's impossible for me to know or improve or if I don't know why I was not appointed as silk when I applied. Mm. You have not applied again 
No, it's not applied again. Why, why not? I think my life just took a bit of a different route. I, um, uh, firstly, in, in 2020, when I acted for that four weeks during the, the COVID period, I realized that I would really like to, if I could, pursue becoming a, a judge more actively and with the good graces of our, our JP, I was invited in 2021 to, to act uh, more regularly. And, and it was a good break for me from my practice, which was dearly needed. And, uh, and further, I really enjoyed um, acting. I felt and I still I feel I make a difference on the bench more so than, than what I do in my practice. Um, so I didn't, I didn't pursue it again. It, it's not something I... Okay. Well, before I leave the, the GCB submission, there is a comment they make, uh, which, is, uh, which does what one would expect. It provides particularity, and uh, it's in respect of something that is quite important. Uh, they say you delayed judgments, and they mention three. One, no, it's two, two actually. Uh, you rust against Kutsie, which they say you delivered five months late. Uh, and the other one is AVW against SVW, which they say you delivered uh, six months after the hearing. Yes, I saw that. And um, yes, they, they were not, not the second one, but the first one, um, I, I admit that it took quite a period of time and I, I would like to, unlike most of the other matters I deal with, that particular matter, I, I attached the judgment. The history of that matter is that it was allocated to me already, I think, in, in June, July, and the matter could not commence because one of the expert witnesses was not available. We then started the trial. I think if you look at the judgment, it looks like it was a, un, a that it only was in court for one day. But we, in fact, sat in court with very extensive evidence for a long period of time. We were in court on the 23rd and the 24th of August. We were in court on the 16th and 17th of September. We were again in court on the 25th of November and on the 30th of November. And then I got further submissions on the legal aspects raised and dealt with experts, a joint minute that people that one of the experts said he's not bound to anymore. And then um, that brought us to the finalization of the matter only at the end, in middle December of 2021, after hearing the matter for, for a long period. And obviously in the interim, I dealt with various other matters. So I could only properly apply my mind, look at the video footage again, consider the expert evidence properly, and then give, a, a, I thought, a well-reasoned judgment um, in the beginning of May. There has been an application for leave to appeal in that matter, and I have granted leave to appeal. It's one of only two matters that, that I have granted now in the interim in another matter, I've also granted leave to appeal. So it took a little bit longer than, than it should have, but um, I think in, in the circumstances, it, I did justice to the parties by properly considering everything that was placed before me. In the other matter, um, I, the matter came before me as an urgent. In retrospect, I probably should have postponed the matter to the semi-urgent role, which would have meant that it probably would have heard, been heard in February. But I, I listened to the matter in the urgent court and I was convinced that the, seeing that a settlement agreement had been signed between the parties and it's a divorce matter that, that it should be dealt with expeditiously. So I then afforded both parties a chance after the 21st of October to submit comprehensive heads of argument on the issue that they raised in that matter, which they did. And I then gave an order, it was an interlocutory order, saying that I am granting the, 
the one party leave to defend. I gave that order in January. Then I tried to find it, but I couldn't. There, then there was a request for reasons shortly thereafter, and I gave those reasons in the beginning of April. So it's, it's a little bit unfair. As I said, it was an interlocutory order, and the, I, I gave an order, and I gave substantial reasons for that order in April. So, so it's a little bit unfair to say it took me six months um, if, if all the circumstances were known. Uh, that is not the case. Well, they do say that you generally deliver your judgments properly. I see. <laughs> yes. Okay. I do. No, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vett. I'll hand over to the rest of the commissioners, starting with uh, your JP. Judge President Klopp, do you have questions for this candidate? Uh, <coughs> good afternoon. Thank you very much, Deputy Chief Justice. Good afternoon, Mrs. Devet. Good afternoon, Jane. A lot of questions that I wanted to ask you have already been asked by the Deputy Chief Justice. May I start off by confirming that you have acted altogether for a period of six months in my division. On each of those occasions, I invited you to act. Yes, Judge. I can also confirm that I sat with you in a criminal matter many years ago as an assessor. I think that's about 20 years or so when yes. we met, right. Now, <clears throat> the first question I would like to ask you is this. In the period of about six terms during which you have acted, yes. how many judgments were in fact reported? I'm not talking about reportable judgments. I'm talking about judgments that have in fact been delivered by you, which have in fact been reported. I, I uh, thank you, JP. So as far as I c could see before today, it's only the one judgment dealing with the um, the police matter, the the Hala Hala matter. Right. So it's one judgment. Yes. Thank you very much. I, I do just want to point out, JP, if I may. Um, I uh, in during last uh, year in 2021. As you would know, most of, of I did a lot of, of third division work, and um, this year, this term and last term, I mostly um, sat with my criminal matters. Um, so I wasn't allocated civil work, um, unless of course something happened and I was a, a, and advised you that I was available. But I've been part of your the backlog program for the criminal uh, trials, and I have done my best in that division. Obviously, you don't write reportable judgments there, but in order to get that matters dealt with. Thank you. Let's talk about crime. How many criminal trials have you, in fact, finished? I have, I'm still busy with the human trafficking trial, and I have um, also started a, a, another one uh, last week on the criminal backlog role. So I... I since I've been acting, I've not finished a criminal trial. Not finished. Thank you very much. I, I have, however, um, dealt with quite a few few uh, bail appeals. I've dealt with um, many uh, uh, 304 reviews with other judges, where uh, even with you, I think, um, where um, I've gone through the process of the review from the magistrate court to the high court. Um, and all the difficulties that uh, with delays and so forth in order to get that going. No, I accept that. Of course, the skills are different. When yes, we talk no, about the trial, that. it's not like reviews. The skills are totally different. Yes. Thank you very much. What's your understanding of the word transformation, Ms. Stephen? What does transformation mean to you? I always think these questions are so difficult to answer. But for me, transformation means that in a country such as ours, we need to, and I think it's in the, I mean, that's the aim of the Constitution, we need to address previous discrimination in, which resulted in imbalances in people of color, women not being in, getting the opportunities and being in positions where they should be. And, and for me, that is transformation, to get to a situation where everyone have 
equal opportunities where everyone, regardless of their gender or color, can be, and that's the transformation process to get to that point. Uh, I think we are still in the transformation process and, and I'm very glad to see that so many more women and, and uh, uh, previously disadvantaged individuals get the opportunity to, um, to sit as judges or magistrates or uh, positions of importance. I think it sends a very important message also to, to the community at large. You know, JP, when I, when I started at the bar 25 years ago, when I applied to become an advocate, we were the biggest group of women who ever applied to become advocates. We were 18 women and that got admitted, who passed the bar exam. And within four years, only four of us were left at the bar. And a year later, only two of us um, were, still, were still left at the bar. And today, it's still the same two women, myself and another female advocate at the bar. Right. Is that your complete answer to transformation? What it means. There is a second level of transformation, which is the mind and the mindset. Yes. That's why yes. you have certain values enshrined in our constitution. Definitely. What do you say to the second level of transformation? Of course, Chief Justice, there must be a change in the mindset of people and, uh, and the way people are dealing with each other. I, I, I don't know how to take it any further than that, but the, the transformation needs to, to get us to a point where we are all equal and where everyone has the same opportunities eventually, and that's why we need transformation. Well, I think it's fair to ask you this follow-up question. There were degrees of oppression in South Africa in the days of apartheid, with whites having more privileges, followed by Indians, colors, and the Africans were right at the bottom of the, of the human race. Now, what would transformation mean in those circumstances where, for example, there is a white woman who was privileged and that white woman is up against an African woman or an Indian woman or a colored woman. What do you understand transformation to mean in those circumstances? Yes, um, uh, Judge President, I, I hear what you're saying and I say that I believe that in those circumstances, and, and I assume uh, we're dealing with, with my particular position as well, that. A, a black female uh, candidate who's um, qualified and um, the correct person to be appointed in, in the position should, in terms of tra transformation, probably have a better opportunity than me. I do, however, think that that's not the only thing that counts. I think that the, you must also look at the demographics um, yes, I, I, am, I am a white female, but yes, I, I have also struggled to get where I am today, and I think one must also look at the bench as it is in the Western Cape. Uh, definitely as a result of your efforts, I would say by giving a lot of uh, women the opportunity to act in the High Court, we see that in the High Court there's, of the Western Cape, there's quite a few female judges, uh, and, and obviously with later appointments, black judges and, 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 and women of color. So I, I hear your question, um, but I think one must look at demographics as well. And in, in the Western Cape specifically, there's only three white female judges. The one is retiring, Judge Stain is retiring in, in December. and. Um, we, the other, then there's two other judges, and one of the other judges often also act in the, the Labour Appeal Court. Not that, um, the point being, I don't think that must be the only criteria. Thank you. Uh, I have one last more question, Deputy Chief Justice. Yes, is this, go ahead. Is, I would like you, there, are, there is one position, Ms. Devet, in the Western Cape, 
and there are four candidates. All of them are known to me, and all of you are invited by me to act. I would like to give you an opportunity to market yourself. Why should we appoint you and not the other three candidates? Thank you, Jackie. I, I thought about that question, and it's a difficult question. And my answer why I, I think I should be appointed is I, through my practice and also through my experience as a mediator, I think that I have something that the other candidates do not have. I have, I have worked for 25 years as an advocate in the High Court in, in matters that's very highly conflictual, a lot of family law and labor matters. Which, and, and through my mediation skills, I have been able to, to deal with that, be comfortable with that, assist people to, to approach litigation, maybe in a less um, adversarial manner, um, which I believe is the move going forward. I have also, and I'm, I'm very proud of that, with the allocation of the... Um, the Scalabrini trust matter against the, the Minister of Home Affairs, um, you would have seen that that's one of the matters that, that is part heard. It is part heard because I am case managing that matter in terms of Rule 37 with, with your blessing. Um, and, and it's worked, it's really a success story in the sense that the Minister of um, the uh, Home Affairs in terms of a SEA order, had to reopen the, the Cape Town Refugee Centre already in 2018. Um, the matter came before me um, for the appointment of a special master and for to find the, the Department of Home Affairs or the minister in, in contempt of court. After hearing argument, I did give an order saying that, that there's a breach of the SEA's order but in line with the, the move towards case management and, and resolving matters in order to, um, to get an, a positive outcome, I suggested case management to the parties and uh, who took, immediately took me up on the offer. And we have since then, by way of monthly case management meetings, they would submit a report. We, uh, we agreed on a very detailed order of how it will happen because it doesn't need help. We meet every month and we don't know what to discuss. So we have monthly meetings and the, the refugee center will probably be reopened in November this year. We, we've gone for inspections and it's resulted, I believe, in, in, in a huge cost saving um, exercise. It has resulted in all role players working together in order to reopen the refugee center, which will have the result of there being a more efficient system. People who, are, who qualify will, will get their status. People who do not qualify or meet the requirements, they will be uh, uh, deported without all the delays that we see now. So I think to answer your question, I, my case management skills, my mediation skills, um, my years of experience at the bar in all kinds of matters, I think that, that in, in, in that, those circumstances, I am the, the, the best candidate for, for this position. In other words, if this commission is with you, you would like us to recommend you for appointment, notwithstanding that you have acted for six terms and you only have one reported judgment, and other candidates have far more than that. Secondly, notwithstanding that you have not finalized a single criminal trial. And thirdly, notwithstanding the obvious delays which have been highlighted in terms of you handing down your judgments. Notwithstanding your experience as an advocate for 25 years, you still delay in handing down the judgments. And I can tell you from my experience as a judge president, candidates who delay in handing down judgments when they are still acting, only become worse after the permanent appointment. So if it takes you six months to produce a judgment, the moment you are appointed, it will take you six years. 
So notwithstanding all of that, we must recommend you for appointment. Yes, Chair, I, I, I've explained the, the matters that was highlighted. Thank you. No further questions. Yes, carry on, Ms. Lillard. Or have you finished, Ms. Divert? Yes. Uh, you finished? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Boshoff, do you have questions for the candidate? Uh, thank you, Justice Meyer. Um, afternoon, Mr. Vett. Um, most of the questions that I wanted to ask have been covered, so I just have a, a technical question that I intend asking the candidates. Um, could you perhaps explain to us your understanding of the appealability of interim orders and what the test or what approach the court would take in determining whether or not to consider an appeal of an interim order such as an interim interdict? Yes, well, well the, the normal approach is that interim orders would not be appealable because the matter had not been finally determined. Obviously, if there is some aspect in, in terms of the interim order that was granted that's got a, a final effect, um, that would in some circumstances be uh, susceptible for an appeal. All right, and then just to follow up on that, <clears throat> are you then familiar with the fairly recent judgment of UDM and another V Labashi Investment Group and others, it's a constitutional court judgment. As I sit here, I, I, I can't. Yeah, so in that, in that judgment, the court found that uh, the old so-called Zweni test of, you know, finality is not the be all and end all anymore. And that under the constitutional democracy that we now uh, live, the question is more one of uh, the interests of justice. Mm -hmm. And the reason I want to point that out is I want to ask, you know, it, it, it's, it's firstly a, a, a constitutional court judgment and it's uh, a constitutional court judgment that deals with a position that was previously assumed to be fairly trite, as you've pointed out. So as an aspirant judge, um, you know, where, where do you stand on familiarizing yourself with latest developments in law and, and, and being certain that you are up to date with such developments? Because one can unfortunately not always rely on the parties before you to, to, to point these matters out and take the court into its confidence, so to speak. Well, as Matt, I think, um, in, in today's, with the technology we have today, we are, everyone um, has the ability now to have, um, to know what's happening with regards to new judgments much quicker as before. Um, it's, it's all out there, it gets published. Um, we are um, on mailing lists, which or groups where all new judgments are, um, uh, circulated so everyone would know if something interesting happened. You, you obviously can't know everything um, whilst you, it's, it's basically impossible. We have the tools in order to, if you deal with the matter, to immediately know what has happened and what the, the latest um, authority. Ch things change, what was law today can, can change tomorrow. So I would say I do keep abreast of, of, of matters as they happen. But sometimes I would need to catch up uh, uh, a week or what later or a month later. And, or if I deal with a matter that pertains to a specific question, then that is the kind of research that you will do in order to know what's happening. Thank you very much. I, I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Mr. Boshoff. Um, Commissioner Marumafai. Thank you very much, Deputy Chief Justice. Good, more, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, did I hear you correctly that one of the areas uh, that you specialize in is children's rights generally, and you have dealt with the Hague kind of cases? Yes. <clears throat> I want to ask you a question in relation to the Hague Convention on the 
several aspects of international child abduction, um, and especially how it is applicable in this country, or how it should be applicable, or how you conceive it. Especially, I want to ask you about the adoption of children um, in the context where the parents are involved. And the matter, on the one hand, seems like child relocation, but on the other hand, it's, it is clear that the child has been adopted by one of the parents. Under those circumstances, what role, if any, should the views of the children uh, play, especially when one has regard to the Convention on the Rights of the Child and various sections of the Children's Act, especially Section 9 and Section 10. What, because when I look at some of the judgments that are coming up in this country, they don't deal with the aspects of the views of the children. Mm -hmm. And that aspect becomes to be very big in the children's jurisprudence. Yes. I'm not sure, what is your view in relation to that? Well, Commissioner, I believe that the view of the child is extremely important, and I think it's not heard enough, and I think it's often not heard in the correct manner. And it, it, obviously it depends also greatly <coughs> what the age of the child is, the, the, how mature the child is, um, the circumstances the child find him or, him or her in. So, for example, in this, um, the, the Hague matter that I've attached, the judgment, um, in that particular matter, we, uh, the, the legal representative that was appointed to interview this little girl, I think she was four or five at the time, spent not even half an hour with her and then what he recommended did not correspond with what he said she told him during their very brief interview. And, and that made me very concerned because how do you hear the child's voice if you don't have someone that's trained and familiar to hear what a child is really saying because a child can tell you one thing but actually mean something else. So, so for me that's extremely important and I think it would be a, a very, I, I've heard in some other uh, uh, jurisdictions, um, there's a move towards um, social workers or, or people who's trained in dealing with children assisting judges to, to hear their voice. So it's not a situation where a child has now got to come and tell the judge or um, a, a, what he or she wants because that puts them right there in the middle. And I think if we can have systems in place to hear children's voices properly, because I think it's extremely important, we will go a long way in, in protecting children everywhere in the world. You are raising an important fact. Is that, um, is it me? But it's always been on. Uh, you are raising an important, I'm not really sure what's going on. Okay, you are raising an important, an important issue, right? Um, in relation to facilitating the voices of children uh, to be heard. And most of the judgments in, in South Africa have actually tried to grapple, grapple with that. There is, a, there is a case, Ford versus Ford, and uh, it was written by the Deputy Chief Justice at, at the time when she was a, a, an acting judge in the Supreme Court of Appeal. And to, to, to some extent, it tries to deal with that. But what I want to understand from you is from a practical point of view, because judges always say, but we are not psychologists, right? Yeah. And we can have all these, all these professionals. Who are, how, how can that be? Should, should it be in camera, in the chambers, in open court? How can we facilitate, assuming that the child is at the stage where they can express their views, and that issue is not in, in contention? Yeah. Practically, how can we facilitate a process that can enable the children to be able to air their views? Well, firstly, um, Commissioner, in, in our division, the, the JP, for example, which I think is the first very important step, has issued new directives that's in operation from June this year, where he encourages judges who deals with children's matters to, re to case manage those matters. In other words, so that that matter does not go to a different judge every time when there's, because they all have, normally have a history, um, so that they don't go to a different judge every time, so the same judge deals with the matter. The second important thing that happened 
is in terms of the, those very same directives, it is recommended that even with Hague matters, the Office of the Family Advocate, um, they've always been involved there, but in all matters, previously it was only if it's a divorce matter. Now, any matter pertaining to the best interest of a child must also be referred to the Office of the Family Advocate. And I found during my acting periods at the Western Cape High Court that the Office of the Family Advocate has been extremely helpful when, when I have a matter and the child is, is very young, I would call upon the Office of the Family Advocate who would know the matters on the roll and ask a social worker to assist me to meet with the child and, and ascertain whether the child um, is in a position to, to give a view or what recommendations he or she can give me in that regard, or whether every situation is different. But I think the presence of the family advocate with their family counselors and social workers, and maybe if private practitioners can assist and make themselves available to, to help the courts in that regard, it would go a very long way. Thank you very much, uh, Advocate. Thank you very much, DCJ. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner. Any questions from the virtual platform? None, thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. I have a question, DCJ. Yes, go ahead, uh, Commissioner Bernard. Thank you, Advocate. Regarding your technical competence to act as a judge, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? I believe that I am, I possess humaneness. I really care about people and their well-being. I also believe that if you care about everyone in that sense and you sit in a position as a judge or a commissioner then and someone has the, uh, the, the chance to have their dispute heard that I provide a forum where litigants and counsel feel that they or experience that they are heard and understood. And I try then, when I give a judgment, to be true to the oath that I've given, that I will consider all the information in front of me carefully and that I then deliberate and decide on that matter without fear, favor, or prejudice, obviously subject to the Constitution. I think that that is my, my strongest um, characteristic as a judge. And I would say that I have to, uh, if we must talk about weaknesses, it's probably the same. I have to, um, Fine, I believe that I, because I care, I always need to be mindful of that fact, especially if, if you look at issues pertaining to, to sentencing and, and be mindful that, that you must never be too harsh or too lenient. You must find a, a middle way and a balance um, in order to deal with any matter before you doesn't matter in, in whether it's civil, children, or criminal matters. Thank you. Thank you, DCJ. Thank, Thank you, Commissioner Bernard. JP Lambo. Thank you very much, DCJ. Good afternoon, Ms. Devet. I'm sitting here. Wait, oh, straight ahead. <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, I just want to raise one thing that has been raised by the G GCB. Um, it's in paragraph 10.2 of the GCB um, report. Yes. That relates to the case of AVW versus SVW and four others. You know that matter? Yes. They say you had the matter in reserve judgment in October and then gave an order in January and then the reasons for that order were given in April. Yes. Are these facts correct? Um, that is the matter I referred to earlier on. 
I, in this matter, came before me in, I think it was on the 21st of October, on the urgent role. And the matter concerned whether a, a, a party should be granted uh, leave to defend or not in a divorce action after signing a settlement agreement. And I then, as I said earlier on, I probably should have postponed the matter to the semi-urgent role, but I thought I had the capacity and I to deal with the matter. And after I heard argument, I realized that it's quite a, a contentious issue and various points were raised pertaining to uh, the, the best interest of the child if I grant a final order of divorce, um, whether they will survive financially if I grant an order of divorce. So I called about, upon the parties to file heads of comprehensive heads of argument on that issue, whether they should be given leave to defend. Could I, could I just uh, that, please, please yes. stop you there? Because I, I just wanted you to confirm if the factual matrix I gave you was correct. It's, you it's, confirm it was correct. It is correct. That you the, had the matter in October, you gave an order in January, and you gave reasons in April. Yes, but I, I, I want to just add that they filed heads after I heard the matter in October, and then I decided the matter on the papers. So all the papers were only before me in November, and yes, I only gave the order in January. Then they called on me to give reasons, and I gave them in April. I see. Yeah. Thanks for the explanation, um, because I think one factor you've confirmed that uh, you were in the urgent court, um, because judicial policy frowns upon the handing down of an order without reasons, especially if a matter has been fully argued. Yes. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. And, uh, well, that policy is relaxed somewhat if you are sitting in the agent court, but even then, what I know is if the matter is very urgent, you would hand down the order, but don't wait for the parties to ask for the reasons. You tell them yes. that I'll give you the order this week, I'll give you reasons in five days' time. Do you agree that that's how it's I, done? I, I agree completely, and that's, that's why I, I started off um, to say that I, was, I probably should have postponed the matter to the semi-urgent role rather than to deal with the matter um, on the urgent role. I guess so you live and learn, um, because it was most definitely not that urgent that I had to deal with it immediately. Okay. But I think... The last question is, when you gave reasons, this is what, after they asked for the reasons. I, I was, it was at all times my intention to give reasons. I also advised the parties yes. that I, I will be giving reasons, and, and I was then advised that they were considering taking my order on appeal, and can I please give the reasons, and I, I then delivered the reasons. So I, I, w I obviously would have given reasons. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ms. Devert. Thanks, Thank you. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Judge President Mulambo. Uh, Commissioner Pillay. Thank you, DCJ. Good afternoon, Ms. Devert. Good afternoon. Um, in response to a question by uh, J.K. Schloppe around what makes your application stand out as compared to the other candidates, yes. um, did I hear you correctly that you indicated the, the nature of your practice at the bar um, is such that it renders your application to be um, more attractive than the other applicants. I, I, what I'm trying to say is that I have practiced at the bar and appeared in the High Court for very many years in very many different kinds of matters. I, I, I did a lot of criminal trials and matters in, when I started practicing, um, but I have experience going to court, appearing in front of judges, um, dealing with complicated matters for many years. And, and what I was trying to say is that on, on top of that, I believe I have the necessary skills 
um, through the mediation courses I've done and that I'm a, an accredited facilitator to also help with the case management aspect of, of being a judge, which I think can assist with, with the flow of cases, with the speedy resolution of matters, and I think that helps, that, that, that is the benefit I see in, in, in my experience. Now, in dealing with these complicated matters over, over many, many years, as, as you've just indicated, um, can you tell me how many juniors have you led at the bar? Well, I'm, I'm obviously not a silk, but I have led, um, at least that I can immediately think of, four juniors and, and females of, of color that I have been on a, either a fee, sh mostly on a fee sharing basis for state attorney work. Can I just understand what that means? You've, you've led four juniors? Yes. Uh, throughout your, your practice? Yes, and mostly in la labor court matters. And yes. um, in, in, in the complex matters that you've dealt with, um, were these juniors also involved on a fee sharing basis? Uh, in, the, in the more complicated matters, I was normally, I would say more, more generally, I was the junior in those matters, even though I mm. have been practicing for a long time. But I guess um, in, in that capacity, I was mostly the junior. Um, so in the situation where I get the opportunity to do um, state attorney work, then I, then I am in a position to pull in a junior on a fee sharing basis. So I give a portion of my fee and I reduce my fee uh, accordingly. So, just, so that's what I could do in, in that regard. All right, I just wanna be, be sure that I understand what you're saying. So you're saying in complicated matters you were being led um, and then in the, in the smaller matters you were able to bring on juniors but purely on a fee sharing arrangement. Yes. Right, and, and of the juniors that you brought on, um, you brought on two black women. I, no, I've, I've, I've worked with four black women in a fee sharing arrangements over the time that I've done, as I said, mostly labor, labor work in that context. Uh, let's use Ms. Davis as an example because yes. she put up a, a letter of support. Yes. Uh, I noted that she did pupillage in 2012, yes. uh, which means she, she started practicing in 2013. Yes. Uh, when was the last time you led her? Sure, I, I can't remember that. I, it must be probably 2015 or 2016. I don't think I was subsequent to that. All right. And the, the other three uh, black women that you've led? Um, I worked with someone, but I, I can't, uh, I don't want to. No, you don't I have to mention Yeah, I can't remember her name now, but I think that was recently in 20, 2019. Right. Um, in, a, in a labor matter for the Department of Social Development, I think. Um, I, w I worked on a fee sharing agreement. Uh, and you don't remember her name? I can't remember her name now right. uh, at the moment. I'm sorry. Right. Thank you, Deputy. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Villiers. Commissioner Club. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good, uh, <coughs> good, morning, good, good day, Advocate. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> After 21 years of practice as an advocate, um, you applied to the Cape, to the Cape Bar yes. um, to be recommended for silk. Uh, the recommendation was refused. Is there a duty on the part of uh, the bar uh, to give reasons uh, for uh, their decision? Not as far as I know, Commissioner, but it, it would definitely assist, I think, all people applying t for SOC to know what the Bar Council, at least, um, saw as your shortcomings, that you don't have enough experience in this field or you, um, whatever the reason may be, in, because that will give you the ability mm -hmm. to consider and, and uh, put in a better application should you want to apply for SOC again. So uh, in that context, I think it would be good if reasons, even if it's just on an informal basis, be provided to, to applicants. 
They are not duty bound. I don't know. I've, I've not been on the bar council, so, so, but I don't think they ever give reasons. My, my second question to you, uh, in your application or your questionnaire, you claim to have contributed to gender um, transformation. Is that correct? Yes, I've, I've tried to assist. Yes. It, it's not clear to me how you went about it. Uh, would you want to comment on that? Well, uh, I guess, uh, as I've pointed out before, I have had uh, pupils that I've mentored and I've assisted in practice. I have, over the years, also mentored informally um, many uh, young female and uh, females of color who started at the bar, and I've always been assisting them. I've assisted with um, FAMAC, with, with, with um, the transfer of skills I, by um, doing training. I have assisted in the training of pupils. On, uh, recently, on an occasion, I was requested to do that. I, as I sit here, obviously, I, I can't practice. I am um, making my chambers available to a, a, also a very junior Council, female council of color who just got appointed and I've given her and, and another young female advocate my chambers to, to with the leave of the bar council to um, help them to establish themselves as advocates. No, thank you very much, advocate. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Club. Uh, we have finished. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much for the opportunity.